Okay, good morning, everyone. So um, I just want to first start off reminding you about the um, annotated bibliographies. If you have any questions with regards to its development, um, feel free to ask um, in the chat room or if you want to get on your microphone to do so. All right, so today we're going to begin our discussions about um, thinking about cancer treatments. And so in that way, I believe it will actually help you in the development of your annotated bibliographies as you become familiar with the literature as it corresponds to um, development of treatments uh, for an anti-cancer application. All right, so I'm gonna go ahead and start um, projecting. So this will be a two-part lecture. We're going to begin in a more um, broad context, just so that you have an understanding of the perspective in the field in terms of the development of therapeutics and what role platinum compounds have played. So when we're talking about treatments of cancer, uh, the three main types are chemotherapy, radiation, and surgery. And so, you know, that's still surprising considering the um, how many years have passed that corresponds to the use of omics um, information in addition to uh, data science in terms of getting much more understanding about what constitutes cancer and possible um, initiation factors. That has led to really promising um, new approaches, but still the primary ones are those three that I've just mentioned. So when you're talking about cancer, uh, you're really talking about a large complexity of diseases. And so there's not something that you can necessarily translate one type of cancer to another. There are some common features and I'm gonna point them out to you today. So when you're looking at a cancer, you, you're focusing on a sort of a heterogeneous um, collection of aberrant cells, um, having the ability to multiply in healthy tissues in the body and being able to spread beyond the tissue of origin, which is known as metastasis. Still, when you're talking about treatment of cancer, chemotherapy remains one of the major options and so ideally, you want to establish a dosage for people that really maximizes the activity of the drug um, for killing malignant cells while minimizing the damage to healthy tissues. But in practice, a lot of these um, therapeutics are heavily toxic. And that is because they hit off-target effects and they lack uh, tumor specificity. Another major problem being that um, cells can be resistant to them endogenously, or there can be a require, an acquired resistance to them after extended use. And so thinking about the history of the development of therapeutics, uh, so currently there is a drive that's really focused on identifying drug targets or druggable targets, but that has not always been the approach. So traditional approaches for the production of anti-cancer drugs focus on screening of different families of compounds against model uh, cancer and even uh, non-cancer uh, cell lines. And so you often see people refer to them as healthy cell lines, but really the they technically they would be non-cancer cell lines. And so this approach is more in the vein of trial and error, a very empirical approach. You also um, hear the, the phrase phenotypic drug discovery approach. And so there's also been efforts to try to formalize this, uh, this um, strategy using a structure activity relationship approach. But nonetheless, this is more like trying a compound and seeing if it has any effect. So you, you often see studies where people report the development of a set of um, family of complexes, uh, compounds um, that may have anti, you know, antiviral, anti, um, you know, bacterial, anti-cancer properties. And these are such generic phrases, they don't really hold much weight. And so, um, but that falls in line with this thinking of, let's just try this compound and see what effect it has without really thinking about the correlation of a chemical structure and the biological environment. But really the landscape for drug development has changed. And so in this uh, study that I'm pointing out to you from the P, um, Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, PNAS, uh, 2018, so they point out that of the 210 new molecular entities, these are the NMEs approved by the FDA from the time frame of 2010 to 2016, NIH funding centered on basic research directly contributing to each one. All right, so 
what that means is that many of these drugs that have um, that have been FDA approved um, comes from uh, funding from the NIH, which is a uh, an agency that really focuses on biomedical applications. And so it is the, the basic research really that has guided the discovery of, of these drugs. So the work focused on the biological targets rather than the actual drugs themselves, meaning we're looking at what is a target-based discovery approach. And so um, people like Robert Weinberg, who is a, a one of the leaders in the cancer biology field, um, you know, his perspective is that a landmark anti-cancer drug um, treatment will be one that targets the molecular mechanism, and I actually should put this plural, molecular mechanisms that keep cancer cells alive, all right? So that is getting an understanding of what are those uh, pathways that allow for cancers to, to proliferate and, and to spread. And so this is a, a study, and there's actually a, um, a sequel study that I, I provide you with the reference for um, that focuses on identifying what are hallmarks of cancer. So there are six distinctive and complementary capabilities acquired during the multi-step development of human tumors that enable growth and metastatic dissemination. All right, so you have sustained proliferative signaling, um, evading growth suppressors, resisting cell death, enabling replicative immortality, inducing angiogenesis, activating invasion and metastasis. All right, so those uh, last two have to do with really this, uh, this idea of the cancer becoming aggressive and spreading. But there are additional hallmarks that are being identified um, having to do with the pro reprogramming of energy metabolism, um, evading immune destruction. So that you do see quite a bit of, uh, of a focus now of an um, immunotherapeutic approach, basically taking advantage of your own body and, and trying to um, adapt your system so that uh, cancer responds to the immune attack. You also have uh, what is known as the enhanced permeability and retention effect. That is essentially that the vasculature becomes more permeable, allowing for um, drugs to be able to seep in and having a longer concentration or more contact with the, the tumor environment. Um, that is, is uh, assisted by the lack of an effective lymphatic drainage. So basically you prolong the concentration of these drugs. Um, you will see, especially uh, for your review article, uh, you will see the um, um, efforts to use this particular feature for the development of nanoparticles to try to enhance delivery of drugs, you know, so that you can essentially encapsulate them into these larger um, uh, features and enable the release of a higher content of drugs within the tumor environment. And you also have what are known as metal-based hallmarks, where there are a number of essential metals that are critical to the proliferation and replication of cancer. All right, so Adriana was asking, what is angiogenesis? So this has to do with the, um, basically, in, um, exactly. Crescimiento de vasos sanguinos. So basically, you're, you're spreading into the, um, beyond the, the actual, if you think about a solid tumor, you're, you're creating these um, blood vessels that is allowing for the, um, the tumor cells. And you will see that, it, I have to be a little bit general here, these tumor cells, because there's actually a, um, a complexity of tumor cells to be able to then spread, all right? So that is what this whole process of angiogenesis is, is that, um, that those features, and you will see a visual to help you get an understanding of, of what that constitutes. So this is a figure that I, I often refer to um, as a highlight of a potential metal-based um, hallmark of cancer, where uh, cancer cells really depend heavily on the use of iron for their enhanced metabolic requirements. Um, also, given that iron is very critical to the replication of cells and their um, proliferation. And so what you see is an overexpression of the transfer receptor. So we're well aware of the function of transferrin as an iron transport protein. So with this overexpression of the receptor, what that facilitates is a greater uptake of iron into the cellular environment. And so additional features that are seen is a loss of this balance of that homeostatic control of the iron that's going in and the iron that's getting released from the cell. We have much more iron being uptake 
into these um, into these uh, cancer cells, and then the subsequent formation of the labile iron pool and then the trafficking. What you see there is much much less storage, but, but rather a greater utility of the iron, as in, for instance, its incorporation in that enzyme ribonucleotide reductase. That is the principal enzyme for the production of um, deoxyribonucleotides, which are essentially the building blocks of DNA. So that helps to facilitate uh, DNA replication and even the DNA repair uh, machinery. And so uh, this is really characteristic of the, um, the propagation of these type of cells. All right, so I mentioned to you that when you're thinking about a tumor, so here we're focusing on a solid tumor, it really is not a homogeneous collection of cells. And that's what makes it quite difficult to design a, a therapeutic, is that you really have to be able to impact the complexity that you see here. So um, you, what you have is this assemblage of distinct cell types. So, so you have the, these cancer stem cells, um, what are considered cancer cells, you even have um, some immune inflammatory cells. And so the, the, the key thing is that Therapeutics, you know, and I'll talk to you a bit about the um, development and the research and development for a therapeutic in terms of examining its, its potency. Well, that is going to be sort of not equal in terms of its impact on these different types of cells. And so when you're thinking about the microenvironments, right, you have the core primary tumor, which has all those different types of cell types. Then you have those um, cells that can then become invasive and then lead to the development of metastat metastatic tumor, you know, distant from the original origin site. Here I'm giving you another perspective. So actually you kind of have to ignore the, um, the other features here because that's actually coming from um, a device that was from that paper that you see referenced here. But I wanted to give you a sort of this visual of that connection between a solid tumor and a, a blood vessel Okay, and so here, where you can see is, you know, this sort of um, a mechanism by which you can have um, certain cells being able to um, deviate from their origin site and be able to use blood vessels in order to then locate in a different location. So you have what constitutes this tumor margin, all right, so that's the environment within. You have these complexity of cells. Um, you also have this extracellular matrix, which one of the characteristics of the matrix is that it tends to be uh, more acidic than the extracellular space of a, of a healthy, um, of healthy cells. Okay. And then um, you do have some of these um, cells being able to um, be migrate away from the origin site and then intravesate into these blood um, vessels and then be able to, you know, move through, uh, uh, using the blood vessels to then relocate. All right, so these are really important features that um, enable the progression and even the this aggressive um, um, spreading of, of cancer. Another really important thing, it's not, it's not such, so easy to um, visualize here, is um, that in the, uh, these environments, you also have a gradient of oxygen levels, and that can actually have an impact in terms of the effect of certain types of treatments. Again, um, that all that idea of, of a therapeutic being able to impact the different types of cells that you see here. So um, as a consequence of this, what people have been focusing on is trying to really develop a different types of therapeutic uh, strategies that can target these hallmarks of cancer. So here I'm just showing you um, a collection of just general uh, types of approaches and what they're trying to impact on. And so for instance, you have uh, uh, telomerase inhibitors uh, targeting that component of enabling replicative immortality. You also have these certain types of anti-inflammatory drugs um, that are really targeting the tumor promoting inflammation. And so you see these different types of therapeutics that are being developed to try to address a certain um, hallmark. And so, you know, it is quite complex. And so something that uh, normally when you're thinking about treatment of people, it, it tends to be a combinatorial approach. And um, these particular ones that I'm showing here 
are sort of the targeted therapeutics. So they're not even necessarily the, um, the frontline drugs that are actually used, but these could potentially be uh, much more effective, yet probably much more expensive to actually um, utilize. All right, so what I want to give you is a perspective from um, the development of a chemotherapeutic and you're going from basic research and then how it can then be translated to um, an animal model and then probably subsequently into um, potential use in humans. And so here I'm just going to give you the overview of things that you're probably going to see in the literature when you read about um, the application of cytochrome C especially in the context of its use for an anti-cancer application. So some of the things will be helpful for you to be able to understand those types of experiments. And so uh, one of the things that people wanted to establish is a measure of an anti-proliferative or cytotoxic effect that a drug can have. And so what I mean by an anti-proliferative effect, just basically you want to stunt the proliferation or the uh, replication of cancer cells. and also very importantly, you want to be able to uh, impose a, a certain amount of toxicity against these cells to facilitate um, cell death, right? So um, whether that's going through a um, triggering, for instance, apoptotic cell death, which is a program cell death, um, you know, these are, these are things that people you know, really think about in terms of the design of, of compounds. All right, so these type of studies involve the use of cell cultures, and normally what people do are uh, use commercially available cells um, that have been essentially immortalized so that you can facilitate a culturing of these cells to be able to grow them up in a laboratory environment, to be able to have stocks of them, um, to be able to then measure a, a collection of compounds against them. All right, so generally what this involves is, is working in a facility that enables you to um, work with mammalian cells. And I, I emphasize mammalian cells because um, you may not necessarily be working with human cells. You might actually work with, um, let's say, mice cells or rat cells that you need in order to then be able to move on to an in vivo model. Right. So that's why I emphasize that um, you want a facility that can be able to work with mammalian cells in general. All right. So typically, you're growing them up in a uh, 37 degree environment, okay, in a humidified atmosphere that contains 5% carbon dioxide. But this part here, there are a number of cell lines that actually do not um, thrive in that type of environment. So you do have um, facilities that have incubators facilitating a 5% carbon dioxide and those that do not have that. Okay. And then you grow up the cells in a culture medium. So here I'm just giving you a representation of a culture medium. Um, and the idea is that you want to approximate the composition of blood, but more importantly, you want to approximate nutrients that are going to facilitate the survival of cells. And so these are some of the uh, features of these are uh, the composition of the culture medium. We have simple salts like sodium chloride, um, sodium phosphate, sodium um, bicarbonate, um, some common acids, um, various vitamins, glucose, you know, glucose being a really important source of nutrition for uh, cells, um, glutathione, which is a biological reducing agent, other additives um, supplemented with the fetal bovine serum. So this is um, serum collected from, uh, from cow. Uh, and so the importance of this is that you want to have provide the essential proteins to enable growth. And then uh, typically, depending on um, your the sensitivity of your cells, but it's typically it's typical to supplement your medium with antibiotics, right? So to prevent any contamination. And then as you see in this um, culture bottle, you also incorporate a pH sensitive dye. Uh, and that's usually a phenol red. The reason for that is that you wanna make sure that the pH is constant. So pH 7.4, you will see that the color of your culture will change significantly uh, if, the, um, if the media is starting to decompose. All right. Another factor is the actual preparation of your drug solutions. And so here I'm going to emphasize a really important thing is, um, you know, there are a number of drugs that are not necessarily water soluble, but that can be made water soluble when you mix them with a um, a miscible cold solvent. Okay. And so one of the things that you have to be um, extremely careful about is the solubilization of your drugs. And here I uh, point to you a paper 
that um, really highlights this um, this reality of certain solvents are just not very compatible with the growth of cells, but also very importantly, they're not actually compatible with the compounds that people use, especially uh, metal compounds. So for instance, um, DMSO, dimethyl sulfoxide, is well known to be uh, uh, cytotoxic, so it can induce cell death. And um, with respect to certain compounds, for instance, the platinum compounds, um, cisplatin, it can actually um, cause for the uh, dissociation of this compound or the uh, rearrangement of this compound because that solvent has metal binding capabilities. And so that's something to um, really consider when you're thinking about the use of a solvent affecting a potential drug that you're trying to examine, especially a metal-based one. So um, there's a, a big, big, big caution as to the use of DMSO. And this is true for any solvent. So even like something like um, a methylformamide DMF, um, you want to be really careful, especially in terms of how much you use. And so I've come across older literature where people use very high percentages of DMSO, of DMF. And the problem with that is that very likely the effects that they're reporting are due to the high percentages of these solvents. They have the capability of, of basically producing a toxic environment for the cells. All right, so uh, the standard approach for evaluating the pharmacological effect of a chemo drug is to basically take these cells that you culture in um, uh, you know, standard culture plates, and then you uh, relocate them and you put them into a 96 well plate, which will uh, allow you to be able to do multiple experiments um, you know, using a, a minimum amount of cells. Uh, and it, it really helps to enhance the high throughput of your data collection. All right, so what typically is done, you put a, a set number of cells into these wells and what you wanna do is uh, allow for at least one day for these cells to acclimate to the new environment. So that's why I say to equilibrate. They're becoming, um, they're becoming you know, adjusted to the conditions of, of where they're removed to, but also um, you know, the media that you're supplementing to them. In the event that you might have to change the, the media that you're using for the particular um, application that you're going to, uh, to use. Okay, so um, that's one important thing. Uh, then the next thing is to consider is, uh, you know, you're going to treat the cells with compounds, varying concentrations, because you want to look at a dose response of the treatment of your cells versus the compounds. We also have to take in consideration relevant controls. And so typically people perform these experiments for one up to three days, although I have seen um, longer term experiments, but I will say in the context of doing these experiments using these type of 96 wall plates, um, typically you know you don't exceed three days. Um, you have to imagine that the cells are alive and they need to be able to use the, um, the nutrition that you're provided in the, in the media. So they will consume it and there's gonna be a limit as to how much that's available in addition to these cells being able to, they're, they're also producing excreting waste. So that you have to be able to balance the um, the conditions of the media to facilitate that the these cells will actually remain alive. All right. And then you typically will use a dye. So this tends to be a colorimetric assay. Um, this dye will help to, to quantify the number of living cells. And so I'm going to be a little cautious about some of the terminology here. Um, in treated versus control conditions. Right. So the National Cancer Institute, this is an institute of the NIH, recommends measuring the number of cells after the one day incubation prior to compound treatment. All right, so I'm gonna emphasize this. One day incubation, that means here, that um, after the cells become acclimated to the plates, then it's recommended to um, determine how many cells are present at that point. And so I'll explain to you in a moment why that parameter can be a valuable parameter. All right. So here's a representation of a, um, of a dye-based assay to try to measure the, um, the number of living cells. And I will say that this is not the only assay, but I'm just highlighting one as a representation of how you can utilize this approach to quantify the number of cells. 
So basically the idea is that we want to use this um, dye as an indicator of cells that are still living. And so you're seeing a transformation of this dye in terms of its color, okay? And that transformation is an indicator of some biological process within the cells um, that if they're alive would be exhibiting this particular function. And so here is a representation of MTT. Um, so this is the 2,4,5-dimethyl-dial-2,5-dimethyl-tetrazoleum uh, 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 bromide. All right, so basically what you're doing is you're subjecting it to a reductase and that um, product, this formazin that's formed, okay, it actually um, is a different color. It actually produces this purple color. All right, so the way this, uh, this particular dye works is that if you have a live cell, the the dye will enter into the cell. It will be bioreduced. So this is a biotransformation process leading to the formation of this product, which you can visualize in the form of a purple color. So what you would do is you would have a plate reader and a plate reader having the, the capabilities of uh, UV-Vis um, absorbance. So you put that plate reader into your instrument and you read the output of absorbance at 595 nanometers. All right. So what you do is you correlate the absorbance at that um, at that wavelength to and to basically measure um, sort of relatively the number of living cells. So I would say this is not actually calculating um, that number um, exactly. It's actually just measuring this correlation of more color means more cells. Okay, so it is a quantitative approach in that regard as it, uh, it does follow Beer's law. All right, so here's a representation of what you would see. And so you have this progression of color where, you know, you have uh, more color, therefore more viable cells. And that color is the indicator that you see there. All right, so thinking about then, well, what is then the output of this data? So normally what you would do is uh, do a, some amount of processing of the data, okay? So you get this absorbance, you compare it to your controls, but also you compare it to um, the, what would be the maximum signal. So the 100% here, um, I should probably put, this is percent um, cell viability. So the maximum, um, this 100% viability is the measure of the maximum number of cells present in the no compound control upon completion of the experiment. So that's how you are able to determine that. And then that parameter 0% is an indicator of the complete loss of living cells, all right? And so when you plot the response of um, the viable cells or the cells to treatment, so the, the concentration of compound, what you get is this uh, sort of logarithmic plot where you will have um, in an ideal experiment, you will have it tailing off at basically zero cell viability. But the reality is that oftentimes, this does not actually reach zero. Oftentimes you might see something like this, where it actually levels off at a, um, at a higher uh, cell viability percentage, okay? And so that then leads to questions about what exactly are you seeing? And I would say that these type of experiments are um, oftentimes overanalyzed. And I'll explain to you what, about what I mean by that. So from this data, and so let me actually clean this up a little bit so you guys can see it. You can determine a very important parameter, which is the IC50 value. That is the inhibitory concentration at which 50% of the maximum number of cells are viable. So from this plot that I'm showing you here, since you're going from the 100% all the way down to 0%, then the corresponding IC50 would be literally the halfway point, which would be 50%. And so you, like I've shown you here, you, you can calculate it roughly by then finding what concentration produces that 50% um, cell viability. And so um, that parameter truly is indicative of a compound's antiproliferative property. Because this type of experiment is more of a measure, at least as, as I'm showing you the data here, is more of a measure of 
an effect on the proliferation of cells. Because what you're looking at over the time course is the cells are going to replicate. They're going to divide. You're going to have more cells. And so you're seeing relative to the control with no compounds, how are you affecting the replication of the cells, right? And so here, what you're looking at is in terms of this dose response, that at the higher concentrations, you're getting less replication of the cells. And so in this particular example, at a constant log of the concentration of the compound, so this being one, okay, you're, you're, you have basically affected the cells uh, so dramatically that there are actually no more cells available, okay? But the way you interpret this is, is how you're impacting the proliferation of the cells. It can be a measure of cell death, but this actual um, measurement here, the IC50, is a measure of the impact on proliferation. So sometimes people will mistakenly say that you're killing the cells, but you actually can't know that unless you've done an additional measurement. And that's why I was telling you about that day one measurement. So um, <coughs> I, will, I will go to that in a moment. So oftentimes, the reality of an experiment is that you're measuring what is known as a relative IC50. All right. So what do, I, what do I mean by a relative IC50? So as I mentioned to you, you often see an effect of a compound that does not actually reach a 0% cell viability. So you may actually reach uh, a, a point that is much higher in terms of cell viability. So as I showed you an example of something like this, okay? And so often then the IC50 that's reported is literally the 50, um, is literally the concentration that's going to give you the um, half of the total signal that's measured, all right? So for instance, you have a signal here and then the cutoff is here, right? So then your objective from that experiment is it, what concentration will produce half of that signal? So maybe something like this. And then, okay, something like that. If you get that type of signal. So basically you're looking at a relative, relative to the uh, maximum and minimum signal. So that is not actually a measurement of um, inhibition of the total maximum signal. Rather, it's from what is actually measured as maximum and what is actually measured as minimum, all right? And so this is actually what's, um, what typically is truly measured. And so often when I look at the literature, I actually like to see the what these are called cell viability curves because I wanna see if the IC50 that they're reporting are a relative IC50 or a true IC50 of, you know, of the concentration that produces 50% of the total uh, viability that's um, maximum cell viability that's measured. Okay, but then going back to what I was talking to you about, how you can use this data to determine whether a compound is killing cells. And so that goes back to um, measuring that day one incubation of cells. Getting that number, so that, that, um, that the correlation of the intensity that corresponds to that number, then when you, you obtain your data after the one, two, or three day treatment with the compounds, then you can take the, uh, what would be the 100% of the number of cells at day one, okay, before treatment, and then you would compare at the number of cells that you see after the treatment, such that then what you're looking at is what is known as an LC50 which would be the lethality concentration at which you have 50% of day one cells, okay? Because that will tell you that you actually are impacting the number of cells total. So um, let's say you start off with 100 cells at the very beginning, but after the treatment with this compound, you then end it off with only a total of 50 cells. That means that you actually have killed cells in this process and not just affected the number of cells that are replicating. So a measure of the LC50 is truly a measure of the cytotoxicity, the ability to kill cells, all right? So um, that's why I say I, I uh, caution you when you read the literature and or even when some people represent their data, 
they often say um, IC50 and they interpreted their the results that they see as um, as cell death, but that not may not actually be the case of what what this data is showing. Okay, so with respect with respect to this parameter, so IC50 is sort of a arbitrary selection of of, uh, of a number. You come across terms like IC25, IC75, but the standard is to um, to compare IC50 values. And also very importantly is to compare this in the context of what is known as a therapeutic index. All right, so let's define this. Basically, the general rule of thumb is to aim for IC50 values that are low micromolar or even less than that for practical purposes, okay? So here I'm gonna give you sort of an exaggerated um, example, but it gives you a perspective. Say that the average adult human has five liters of blood and you have to administer a drug via, let's say IV, um, okay, anywhere from 50 milliliters to one milliliter solution. Um, one liter is, you know, that's uh, probably the, the, the extent that you, you can deliver. If a compound has an IC50 in the mid micromolar range, then you would need to prepare solutions at very high concentrations, which may not be feasible, especially if a solution is um, poorly soluble, or sorry, if, if a drug is poorly soluble. So just imagine, you're administering something um, in order to reach a concentration that could impact um, in the body uh, cells. And so we're, we're thinking in the context of unrealistic, right? Because, you know, a certain tumor, if you're focusing on solid tumors located in a certain part, um, trying to go through the bloodstream, you're going to get dilutions. You're also going to have issues in terms of how much actually can effectively reach there. But let's say ideally, if all of it can reach the environment of the tumor, then you would need, if you think about volume of delivery and concentration, and then the volume of dilution, you know, the, the bloodstream, how much blood is in, in the human, you would need a very high concentration of that compound to even consider having an impact. But again, I say that this is an exaggerated example because you don't often, I mean, you, you never just deliver one dosage. You, all, you, you will deliver dosages over time. So it's the, the added effect of the constant dosing is what, where you're gonna have the, the most impact. But nonetheless, this is still true. You want to have a compound that is as potent as possible so you don't have to deliver as much into the body. And keep in mind that many um, chemo uh, drugs are toxic. So the less you use, the better. There's also another really important parameter and, and that is what is known as the therapeutic index. So often people will measure this, right? And they will measure this in the context of um, having a control non-cancer cell. And um, what they would do is they will screen their compounds against a certain cancer cell line, obtain the IC50, and then screen their compound against a non-cancer cell line, preferably one that's of the same tissue of origin, okay? And you obtain this ratio. And so the, ideally, you want to have an IC50 value, right? That, um, so this actually should be the other way around. This, I will fix that up, which would be less than one, okay? Um, because you want to have a, an IC50 that is much lower for the cancer cell and much higher for the non-cancer cell, right? So you want it to be uh, more selective for uh, the, the tumor cell that you're, you're screening and certainly not um, toxic for the non-cancer cell, right? And so that is ideal. Oftentimes uh, you will see in the literature that one cell line is used as the non-cancer control, and then you have a series of other cancer cells that are used to screen um, a particular compound. So, you know, this measurement of a strong therapeutic index is, is an important one, but oftentimes it's not something that is well characterized. All right, so a thing to, to note is that focusing exclusively on IC50 values can be mi mis misleading. Um, and there are a few reasons why, especially in terms of the, the, the standard approach to try to measure the potency of a compound. But here is an example where we have these two ruthenium compounds, NAMI um, A and then Rapta T. Okay, so these particular compounds were inactive towards primary tumors. But um, 
For whatever reason, they were extremely active against these uh, several secondary metastasis tumors that came from these primary tumors. So let's say that you were screening against um, the cell lines, these compounds, you wouldn't really be able to pick up this effect. Another really important thing that, as I mentioned to you um, previously, is more effective to follow a sort of a target-based drug discovery approach. Get, so basically, if you're trying to reach a certain target, it will be good to see if your compound is actually hitting that target. So whether you do an experiment where you're focusing exclusively, say that you're trying to target a particular protein, right, that it's somehow affecting the, um, the proliferation of, of, uh, of cancer cells, right? Um, you want to see that you have a high affinity for that protein in addition to seeing that when you're working in the context of the cell environment, that you actually are impacting the cell itself, that you're actually having an effect on, on whether it's antiproliferative or cytotoxic. So the combination of that data is critical. And then also very importantly, is to focus on effect on several cell lines. You often see um, papers that claim that a compound is effective against a certain type of cancer, but really in the paper, they only focus on one cell line. One cell line really is not indicative of the, the reality of the actual condition. Okay, so related to this um, is a measurement of the amount of drug that's actually getting into the cell if, and I, I say I'd be very cautious, if the requirement for its activity is that it actually enters into the cell, okay? So there are different approaches that one can take. Um, for instance, if we're focusing on a metal-based compound, then you can use um, these elemental and analytical approaches, um, atomic absorption spectroscopy or ICPMS, to measure the metal content within the cellular environment compared to untreated cells. And so typically you get this measure of the, let's say, as an example, the number of moles per cell or mass of, 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 of the metal per cell. Um, these type of approaches can be quite cumbersome in terms of getting um, this sort of this measurement of a number um, per cell. And it's also, as, as you can imagine, is that's not going to necessarily be a homogeneous measurement anyways. Some other approaches that people take, again, being focused on a metal-containing compound is the use of imaging agents as, for instance, a ratiometric probe that can allow for a relative quantitative measurement. So a ratiometric probe is something that can measure um, the amount of, uh, of a probe when it is bi bound to a metal versus the uh, signal for the probe when it's not metal bound. So getting that ratio and tracking that ratio over time, you can see the progression of the amount of metal uptake into the cellular environment. Okay. So in this vein, you can, you can actually do a direct intracellular measurement as long as you have the capability of measuring that signal. All right. And then um, from those type of experiments, um, particularly those that you can actually do by imaging a cell, you can do what is known as a, um, an uptake plot. So you can measure uptake over time. And depending on how you know, this data, it can give you some indication about perhaps possibly the route of uptake, whether it's passive diffusion or even a transporter assistant. But oftentimes, these can be quite difficult to, um, to analyze. And another really important thing that I want to note is that just because you have an increased uptake of something does not necessarily equate to greater potency. And so that has to do with really, let's say that you're trying to use a drug delivery approach and you, you're able to use a, a vehicle that allows for greater uptake. But let's say that that vehicle enters into the cellular environment, but it does not facilitate the release of the compound. So yes, you achieve the goal of a greater amount of the drug, but if that drug cannot reach its target, it's not going to be effective. So that's something that's also very important to take into consideration in terms of the utility of, of this data. All right, there are a lot of limitations of cell work, right? And that's why it's, it's, it's sort of the starting um, of basis for evaluating the, the potential therapeutic application of, of, of a drug. Um, so, uh, you know, people commonly use uh, these type of screenings because they are generally easy. Um, you're working with commercially available um, cells, so you're not necessarily working with primary cells that you can't necessarily culture. You work with cells that are very easy to culture, but there are things that you have to take in consideration. So these particular cells, to an extent, have been modified. So um, some of them have a, uh, their genetic makeup 
altered to, to be able to respond to the environment of, um, of the culturing process of the culturing media. Um, and also, as I mentioned at the very start, when you're working with these um, type of screens, you're basically looking at cells that are homogenous and that's not representative of the, if you're thinking about a solid tumor, of the complexity of a solid tumor, the, the heterogeneous environment of it. So some of the ways that people have um, started to overcome some of those limitations is by actually doing what is known as a three-dimensional cell culturing. Um, here, you're essentially trying to grow up these cells and develop them into a, what is known as a tumor spheroid, which can then mimic um, some of the microenvironments that I was mentioning to you earlier about these um, about certain uh, solid tumors. And so some of the things you can see is, for instance, um, create the environment where as you go from outside to inside, the concentration of oxygen becomes less. And so I don't think I hit that point earlier when I was showing you the um, the tumor, um, the solid tumor, and then the blood vessels. Well, these cells that are further away from the blood vessels, those cells tend to have lesser oxygen. And so that gradient of oxygen can actually really dramatically um, affect how much of an impact a certain therapeutic has, especially if, let's say, a compound depends on, uh, the, on the availability of oxygen to be effective. So that's, that's something to, to really think about. And so um, people have been um, using this approach to better mimic the, um, the tumor environment to then get a better understanding of, of the potential effect that a, a compound may have. Okay. But then let's say that your screening um, leads to something that you believe meets your criteria. Your, your, you think that, yes, I, I definitely hit something that, that is worthwhile to move forward. And so that is when people start to think about, well, what about animal models that you might, well, might want to use? Um, and so here's just an example of, of a type of animal model. It's not the only one. So you can come across a literature where people may want to use bacteria as as their in vivo model, just to see a general toxicity of a compound, or they may use um, a certain type of, of fish as an example. Um, you also have people move to uh, mice models um, for because you want to try to better mimic the environment that's, I would say, closer to the human environment. All right, so here are just some examples of the type of uh, approach that you would take to um, translate what was done in terms of the um, in vitro environment and then move it to this type of animal studies. So this is what is known as a patient-derived tumor xenograph. So tumors taken from human cancer patients will be implanted into mice. And so then those, those cells um, will proliferate. They will then form into a tumor. So in this example, into a solid tumor into the, in the mouse. And so you see the example here where you culture um, cells from uh, human and then you will inject it and then it will form into a solid tumor into a mouse and then you were able to see the effect of your of your given compound in terms of being able to potentially reduce the tumor or not necessarily reduce the tumor keep it from growing okay. and so this type of strategy people have tried to use as a way to provide what is known as a patient specific um, drug development approach or uh, a patient-specific um, uh, treatment where you take live cancer patient cells uh, in addition to the tumor genomic data um, and then you can look at how um, treatment in, in an animal model using those those cells um, you might be able to come up with with an approach that might work on the on the person itself right, but there are disadvantages with using this um, a major disadvantage of using this particular type of model is that you must uh, the work must be done under immune compromised conditions. And why immune compromised? Because you're introducing something foreign to these mice, right? And so you have to be able to suppress the effect that the immune of the mouse can have towards the um, the actual tumor, right? Because remember, even in, even if cancer for us, our body tries to fight. The, the cancer, and that's something that people try to do is boost our immune system's um, ability to attack cancer. So something very similar um, is, is what you have to think about in this context. 
There's also what is known as those genetic models. So here, tumor implants are derived from the same animals. So what that means is that, that let's say that you have a certain strain of, of mice, um, you have a particular type of cancer, you take the cells from that, um, that tumor, you then inject it into another mouse of the same type, right? And so now you have uh, this tumor, so you can actually be able to study it in, in, in a much more controlled um, context. And so then you don't have to do what is um, basically do this under immune compromised conditions. But then there is the disadvantage that the tumor that you're looking at are not human derived. And so you're going to have those limitations there, right? So ideally, um, when you're thinking about in, um, these type of in vivo studies, it may be worthwhile to use more than one animal model because you might you might get some really important um, differences that if you work with just one, you might not be able to sc um, screen out. All right. So then, this leads us to focusing on um, platinum two compounds, and really we're going to highlight um, cisplatin here. All right. So cisplatin, um, in terms of of the what type of metal compound it is? So it is a platinum two compound and it has a square planar structure. So what, why is this cisplatin? Well, it's because of the arrangement of the ligands in a manner that they are in a cis arrangement, so they're adjacent to one another. So the two amine groups are cis to one another, two, two chloro groups are cis to one another. So that's why it's cis, diamine, dichloroplanum two. And then very importantly, and something I said early in the course that I, I would let you know, how would you know if coordination number four would be square planar? So typically speaking, when you have um, a D8, um, D electron configuration, that would typically be, for coordination number four, a square planar geometry. And um, corollary to that, these would be diamagnetic species. So this compound was serendipitously discovered. What I mean by that, it was a, a surprise discovery. And so I mentioned to you this on the first day of class, um, there were some platinum electrodes that were being used to be able to study um, bacterial replication, but what was observed in the studies was that the, there was something in the, uh, in the experiment that was inducing um, an effect on the replication of the bacteria. And so by probing what was going on in solution, it was, uh, it was discovered that there was a platinum compound that was forming in solution. And so then people thought, well, what about uh, we test this against mammalian cells, mammalian cancer cells, to see if there's any actual anti-cancer effect, and it turned out to be the case. And so, really, this compound has revolutionized the um, the medical field, right? The use of a metal-based compound um, in terms of a human application. And cis plan, plan or the plan on two compounds, even today, are still gold standard compounds against which other metal-based anti-cancer drugs are judged, and even other non-metal-based ones are judged. But as I've mentioned to you um, previously, um, cisplatin is, and just like many other chemo, um, chemo drugs, is quite toxic. So it does have its, its ability to suppress certain cancer, but it, it is very toxic. And so we're gonna get an understanding of why that's the case. We probably won't see it so much today, um, but we will finish our discussion in our subsequent lecture. All right, so some of the, the, um, the things that we need to be aware of, especially as it relates to just sort of general um, coordination chemistry. So compound lability and stability, and I put this in, in um, parentheses because I'm actually not showing you something that has to do with stability, but compound lability is key to the therapeutic application, so lability and stability, key to the therapeutic application of several, several metal compounds. All right, why lability? So lability has to do with a metal being able to exchange its ligands. All right, why is that important? Well, if we're thinking about, you know, an anti-cancer effect, and we're thinking about um, a, a target approach, and you want a metal to reach a certain target, well, that metal in this coordination compound needs to be able to exchange its ligands to then be able to be coordinated by a given target, right? So that liability, which is the um, how quickly it can exchange its ligands is going to be important. Whereas stability is important. Stability means how stable the compound is in solution, right? Whether the ligands remain bound to the metal or not is another important factor. 
but one and the other, they're not the same thing. So liability is, has to do with a ligand exchange process. So here I'm representing that where we have a, um, a parent metal complex. Okay, so you have M um, bound by a certain number of ligands of which I'm identifying one as a leaving group. And then you have this other ligand that's available that will serve as this entering group that's going to facilitate this nucleophilic substitution, okay, where the leaving group is dissociated, and then that entering group is now coordinated to the metal. So if the ligand exchange occurs with a half-life of less than or equal to one minute, then that particular compound is called kinetically labile. So it reacts rapidly to ligand exchange. However, if that half-life is greater than one minute, then that compound is kinetically inert. It will react slowly. Okay, so these are just relative terms. Um, and so depending on the, um, you know, the physiologic environment, this exchange, you know, maybe something that occurs in over several minutes or even hours may be something that's still physiologically relevant. All right, well, how do you get a, a gauge of liability? So one um, standard approach is by what is known as the water exchange rates, which is used to dictate metal liability. So for instance, here I'm giving you a representation of a metal compound it's basically the metal ion equated. So it has these water molecules. So in this type of experiment, well, uh, what we've done is that you use an isotopically labeled form of water, and you basically track its exchange with the regular water that's bound, that's uh, coordinated to the metal. So you're looking at that exchange of isotopically labeled water with then standard water. And so from that information, you can measure the rate constant of the water exchange, okay, where then that rate constant is a gauge of liability. So here I'm showing you a standard um, plot that you would find in a inorganic chemistry course. Um, I'm just giving you the overview so that you can see what types of metals are consider considered kinetically labeled to ligand exchange and what type of metals, um, coordination, see, uh, transition metals, are considered kinetically inert. Right? So using that, this parameter here of the, um, the rate constant, so between uh, a rate constant of one per second to 10 to the 10, we have those metal ions that are kinetically labeled. And this is just based on the water exchange. And that um, for K values that are one or less, that represents metal ions that are kinetically inert. And so if you see, Platinum 2 plus falls into that category. All right, so what does that mean? That means that platinum um, is going to be very slow about exchanging its, its ligands. All right, so why is that important? Well, it's important because when we're thinking about this idea of, 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 of using platinum as a drug, right, and thinking about its, uh, its biological targets, well, you know, how do you actually use this metal that is slow at ligand exchange? So one of the things that people have have noticed about um, platinum two chemistry is that uh, you have what is known as a labelization effect that is known as a trans effect. So again, platinum two is a uh, square planar uh, coordination number four. So here we're focusing on two ligands, your leaving ligand and a ligand that is trans to um, that particular ligand, so trans positioning across the platinum. And so this trans effect series, what this is, is that anything, as you go from left to right, so you, basically you're going from here to right, and then it continues on all the way over here. The further right you are, the more affected those ligands are at inducing the dissociation of the leaving group. Okay, so the, the um, I, I'm actually, let me clean this up. Let's say, uh, let's see, going left to right. Um, the ligands can induce a greater labelization of a trans ligand. And what 
I mean by the trans terminology here is the ligand that's trans to it across the platinum, okay? So again, if you go further right uh, along the, the trans effect series, the, um, the better able those ligands are to induce, to speed up the process of the ligand exchange, all right? So that's the idea of inducing labelization is increasing the rate of dissociation of this ligand group away from the platinum. Okay, so here, just show you some representation of this. So um, when you take uh, inorganic chemistry, you will be able to, to see this much more closely. And you actually can learn um, a number of the factors that contributes to this um, ligand exchange process, of which trans effect is one of them. It's not the only one, right? So here is the example of how you can create the, let's say, the trans platinum version of the compound starting from platinum where you have all four amine ligands. So here, when you want to exchange one of these amine groups by introducing a chloral ligand, well, that chloral group can go to any of those sites because basically all those ligands are equal. So you introduce a chloral group, you have a loss of, a, of one of the amine groups, you see the chloral group can be in any one of those spots. But then you have a second chloral group coming in, and then where is that chloral group going to go? Well, the chloral group is going to go in the spot um, where you can identify um, a ligand that would be further to the right of the trans effect series. So when we look at the trans effect series, we have to focus on the amine ligand and the chloral ligand. The chloral ligand is further to the right. Because it is further to the right, it would have more of a trans effect. It would be able to induce the labelization of a ligand trans to it. So here then, this chloral group will be able to induce the dissociation of that particular group so that that becomes associated. And then this new this um, chloro, other chloral group would, would be able to serve as a nucleophile and then dissociate that amine ligand, and then you would generate this compound here. Well, then at the bottom, what we see is the generation of cisplatin, right? Starting from um, platinum, when you have all four chloral ligands. So here you have a very similar scenario as you did in the reaction A, right? Where you have all four ligands identical. And so here, what we're doing, we're introducing an amine group. Okay, now that's going to be our nucleophile. All right, and so because all four chloro groups are identical, that amine group can go into any one of those positions. All right, so we see that, and then this is dissociated. But then the question becomes then, when we introduce the second amine group, where is it going to go? Well, it turns out that two chloro groups, because uh, they are further, both of these are with respect to the chloro group that is trans to the amine group, they will have a higher labelization effect such that then that amine group can go can displace either one of them. So you will have the amine group come in and you can then displace that chloro and you get this final product. Okay. All right, so this has to do again with the relative positioning of the ligands on the platinum along the trans effect series. All right, so that is a factor that can affect the relative rate of exchange, all right? But another factor, and here's where now um, uh, we're going to get into this idea of what stability can do, excuse me. I'm not sure why it's cutting off, uh, so I can, there it goes. Um, how stability also plays a role here. Okay, so relative lig metal ligand affinity constants can dictate physiological speciation. We are all aware of that by now, right? Um, but how does it play a role with respect to cisplatin? Okay, it turns out that the platinum chloro um, bond is weak. And so the concentrations of chloride in the, uh, in the biologic fluids can affect whether or not that, uh, the chloro groups will remain coordinated to the platinum or the dissociate. So if we think about the concentration of chloride in the extracellular space in blood, okay, we have a concentration of chloride of about 104 millimolar. Right? That's a, a high amount of chloride to keep the compound intact. But when you introduce the um, cisplatin into the cellular environment, you have a dramatic decrease in the concentration of the chloride. So you go from 104 millimolar now to 4 millimolar. Still, biologically speaking, millimolar is still very high. But that change in the concentration is enough of a change 
to then lead to a dissociation of one of the chloral groups. Okay. And so that leads to um, a, an aqua ligand then coordinated to the platinum. All right. This is actually an oversimplification because I'll show you. These are the processes that, that can result in the, in the presence of, um, you know, the, uh, under these conditions in water, okay, um, obviously in the, in the absence of, of chloride, what's gonna happen? Okay, so what happens is you get substitutions of the chloro groups okay, for the aqua ligands. And you can also get, as we've discussed previously, hydrolysis of the water, okay, that can occur as well. And so um, over here, what we see is complete substitution of both chloro groups and then um, hydrolysis occurring here, All right? So this would be a representation of the aqua speciation of that compound if you introduce it into water, all right? <coughs> and so that's actually gonna be really important. What else is really important? So I'm gonna ask you guys, um, looking at this information, okay, what else do you guys notice about this, um, excuse me, the speciation here? Actually, okay, so we change the coordination around the metal. What else do you guys see has changed? I was trying to clear up this slide. There it goes. All right, what else has changed? You can put your answer in the chat. You can get on your microphone and then let me know. Give you another moment to think about what else has changed due to this process of the exchange of the chlorides for water. Yes, I'm seeing charge. Yeah, we do see that we're getting species that are charged. For instance, so we're, when we think about this plan, we have a neutral compound. But then when we have this change of speciation, for instance, the exchange of the water, you will have a, um, a cationic species. This hydrolysis results in something that's neutral. You can also have this di um, cationic species. All right, so you, you can change the charge and the charge of a compound can really influence whether it might be able to cross the, um, the, the, uh, the membrane barrier, okay? So that's something um, that's important. But in addition to that, so that's just the, the effect at the level of, of just introducing that compound to water, low concentration of chloride, okay? Is then, well, what if we also incorporate another component? Well, what about carbonate? Remember carbonate, um, this is present at, um, let's talk about bicarbonate, it's present at 27 millimolar in our blood, okay? And it turns out that carbonate can actually ligand exchange with uh, the platinum. All right, so you have the, the, the water exchange and then the ligand exchange. So now you can get these, um, these uh, carbonate um, ligands coordinated to the, uh, to the platinum. Now you have these charged species, but now it's negative charge, right? So you, now you're affecting the, uh, the charge of the platinum of the, in terms of the, its complex, the, the complex itself. And so that speciation can have a dramatic impact in terms of the overall amount of platinum that can enter into the cellular environment, right? So these are the things that one has to consider in terms of thinking about what is the fate, the biological fate of a, of a given um, metal species. All right, so let's go into that, this concept. So dosage and biological fate. So typical dosages, and so I would say this is a little bit hard for me to understand. So I, I'm gonna have to look up uh, something else that's a little bit easier to understand. So we're looking at, at dosage between 20 to 140 uh, milligrams per meters um, uh, to negative two. So this is based on body surface uh, via various administration forms. Okay, so I, I wanna see if I can look up something in terms of body mass, because that's another parameter that people normally talk about in terms of the uh, um, grams of a certain drug versus the body mass. Okay, but I didn't, I, I will look that up. All right, so in terms of the half-life uh, for the rapid phase of platinum clearance from plasma, after infusion, because typically 
um, cisplatin is delivered via, via an infusion port. Um, uh, so that half-life is, is about half an hour. All right, so most of the platinum too is eliminated in the urine. And the, then whatever remains in the body, in the bloodstream, of that amount, you have anywhere from 65 to 98% becoming protein bound um, in amongst the, the blood proteins, of which the dominant protein is human serum albumin. And then human serum albumin is actually the highest concentration protein in our blood. This protein exists at about um, 600 micromolar. This is a very high concentration. Okay. So here I'm just giving you a perspective of potentially how platinum can coordinate to albumin. Uh, so here, albumin uh, amino acid could be either histidine or methionine. Okay. Well, if you think about platinum, let's go back to our, our thinking about hard, soft, acid base um, theory. Platinum is actually platinum 2 plus is a soft metal. So it's going to have a preference in binding to something that's, um, let's say, thiol groups. A methionine has a, a sulfur group. Histidine, is, um, we're, we're talking about a nitrogen group, but it also has the capability of binding there. Just to give us a visual depiction here, here is a structure showing <clears throat> platinum coordinated to um, different um, parts of, or, or different um, localities within the human serum albumin. So here is sort of a, um, an inset showing the uh, platinum coordinated to histidine and also platinum coordinating to the sulfur group of methionine, right? So that's actually really interesting. Also very interesting about this, um, this speciation is that this can result in an imbalance of zinc because the platinum can result in a displacement of some amount of zinc bound um, human serum albumin. Human serum albumin has the capacity to serve as a, as a vehicle of, um, tr of transport for certain things. Um, it's like one, one of our primary ways in which we can distribute fatty acids in our body. Fatty acids uh, in blood, not, not soluble, but, uh, but it's binding to human serum albumin allows for it to get transported in our blood. Um, the same thing is true that it can bind metals and facilitate their, their transport. Really, the interaction of albumin and drugs is something that people really characterize because also the, the, um, the binding of certain um, compounds or, or even metals to um, albumin could also affect the ability of that metal to be able to reach targets because another property that people look at is the albumin can serve as sort of as a, as a clearing agent. So just like it can serve as a delivery agent, it can also serve as something that clears things from our system. All right, so there's a little bit of complexity there. But in terms of um, thinking about the biology fate of, of platinum, it can become bound to um, albumin and then an effect that it can have um, is that it can displace some of our essential metals. All right, so remember, I did say that this metal is not necessarily um, that, that friendly to our body. All right, so the influx of cisplatin. Okay, so now here I, I'm simplifying things, right? Because now I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about it as just this compound, the intact compound. Now thinking about its speciation in, in blood and, and the, those parameters. So thinking about the intact compound, from that perspective, how possibly it can enter. So it can possibly enter via um, passive diffusion and then, then in the intracellular environment, then it undergoes um, the ligand exchange because of the lower amount of chloride, right? There's also some indicators that it can go through a copper transfer protein, CRT1, okay? And so that's a, that's a really important thing. Um, some people have correlated copper chelation with trying to make cells more sensitive to cisplatin because going through this pathway, if you have less copper going through it, you can then improve the amount of, of platinum that's able to go in through this transporter. All right? That's some, uh, some thinking that people have, um, have um, thought about the use of potential copper chelators to really impact the effect of platinum. All right. But then you also have what are known as the efflux process. And the efflux of the cisplatin as it as it correlates to cell resistance. So this is one of the major drawbacks of cisplatin is acquired cellular resistance, where multi-drug resistant proteins, for instance, ATP7A, ATP7B, these are copper trafficking transmembrane proteins. Um, well, they're also known to be things that are enable the efflux of drugs and making them less um, effective. Well, they can bind. Um, 
the cis plan or they can bind the platinum at cysteine residues in their N terminal metal binding domains. And so being able to bind the platinum, you know, taking advantage of that hard, soft acid base theory, right? Taking advantage of that, they can able then to capture that platinum and just release it from the cells. And what you what is observed is that there's elevated expression levels of these exporters um, leads to increased compound removal and therefore acquired cell resistance. Um, you also have an efflux of cisplatin due to another factors affecting your speciation and, and, and this leads to cell resistance where um, glutathione, um, this small molecule, this peptidic um, reducing agent takes advantage of its thiol group. Okay, well, it's not actually, you know, it's not, not as if it's actually thinking about it, right? But it, through its thiol group, it can coordinate to platinum forming these type of platinum amine uh, uh, glutathione complexes. And then that compound um, has a capacity of getting efflux by the multi-drug um, resistance protein MRP2. So the formation of that species in this sort of biotransmission of the cisplatin results in something that can be efflux from the cell and there's an overexpression of this transporter which can then make the cells less sensitive to cisplatin. All right, but then thinking about well, what after all that speciation and all the, the you know, this acquired cell resistance, well, what is potentially the target of, of uh, cisplatin? And so DNA has long been attributed to be the target of cisplatin. So following the formation of aquatic um, cisplatin in cells, one to 2% of the platinum, that's from the, the amount that was dosed to the amount that gets in, into the cell, right? One to 2% of the platinum can form an adduct with DNA. And so here I have representation of the types of adducts. For instance, you can have um, one, two intrastrand um, crosslinks with guanine guanine se sequence at the N7 site of the guanines, or you can have um, one, three intrastrand, again, of guanine guanine sequence at the N7 site. You can have a um, guanine guanine interstrand um, crosslinks as an example here. All right. You can even have, depending on the type of speciation, right, you can even have these mono adducts where the platinum is coordinated to simply one, um, one of the bases, right? All right. And so regardless of what you're seeing here, the, um, the end result is that platinum, and this, this thing is that all the different factors of a species that I was telling you, the platinum can coordinate to the guanine residues, um, and we're specifically talking about the nitrogen of the, of the base, and then that can have a dramatic structural effect. So here's an, an example of that it can distort the structure of DNA so much. And what does that really mean? Well, here I show you an agarose gel electrophoresis. So it's something that Alondra has been doing, so she can probably talk to you about this. Well, you're looking at the effect on DNA. So if you're talking about uh, supercoil DNA, if you start to distort it, what's going to happen? Well, that, that, that DNA is going to lose its structure. It will unwind and it will lead to a linearization. So supercoil DNA and linearized DNA actually run very differently on an agarose gel, okay? Where a supercoil DNA will move further along in a linear form will move less along. So here we're looking at an effect of cisplatin linearizing the DNA, and then you're also looking at an effect of cisplatin even causing fragmentation, okay? So these are effects that DNA can have. All right, so I'm gonna leave it here. So this is gonna be our stopping point. I will review some of these things. I know I went a little quickly there, and but I will leave it here so that we can further our discussion about the, um, the effect of cisplatin in the body. All right, everyone, I'll see you next time. Have a great weekend.